Good evening. Happy Friday. My name is Summer and I am a real alcoholic and a real addict. Welcome to uh, our uh, Friday night big book study. Um, this is Big Book Compendium. The spiritual life is not a theory. I'm honored tonight to um, introduce my guest, our guest, David G. And I would love if you'd introduce yourself and tell us a little bit just about yourself and well thank you summer and i am honored to be here and part of this uh, big book study because i am a big book enthusiast and a big book thumper i uh, love the big book of alcoholics anonymous it has helped me change my life and uh and convert it and help other people with theirs because i get to work uh, and intensively with other alcoholics because of this book so my sobriety date is november 13th uh, 1999 that is a god-given date and um, i have a sponsor and he knows he's my sponsor. As a matter of fact, I was over at my sponsor's house this afternoon. I go to my sponsor's house every Friday at four o'clock. And the funny story behind that, if I got a second to do that, if you don't mind. Absolutely. The funny part about that was, is uh, I uh, had a sponsor for about 20 years, the same guy, lovely guy, 44, 45, 46 years of sobriety. One of the nicest men you're ever going to meet. I mean, he is just a father figure to me. But I moved and I wasn't going to the same meetings with him and I wasn't calling him. And guess what I was? I was unsponsored for a long time. And uh, I was starting to go to these meetings in my local area where I met uh, my best buddy, David here, who's uh, on this call. And um, I asked this other guy to be my sponsor. And uh, one of the things he asked me to do was to get with him on every Friday. And I thought, dude, I'm 20. This is my thought. This is not something I expressed to him, just so you know. <laughs> I said, dude, I'm over 20 years sober. <laughs> Why would I have to get with my sponsor once a week? Because that's not something I've done in the past. And there's something in my sponsorship lineage and David and I, and we talk about this is I don't get to make decisions like off the cuff. I have to go and consider things. And I considered it and I prayed about it. And I said, absolutely. He's my sponsor. And if that's what he wants me to do, that's what I'll do. And I've been doing that now for years with him. Every Friday we get together, we spend an hour together. We basically just go talk about big book. We talk about sponsorship. We talk about a whole lot of stuff, but uh, it's brought our relationship to levels that I, I haven't experienced. The one thing that is based upon more than anything else is truth. That is a person that I can be absolutely positively truthful with without any judgment, without uh, the arbiter of, of my feelings. He is there for me. And uh, it, it is one of the best relationships I, uh, I have. So, um, and I have a home group and my home group happens to be a cocaine anonymous group. I'm an alcoholic and a recovered uh, addict. And it's on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Central time. It's in Aurora, Illinois. David and I attend that one. And uh, I, I, part, I go to my home group 99.9% .9 of the time. So that's my introduction. Thank you, Summer. That is awesome. Is it on Zoom as well or just in person? I'm sorry, I didn't say that. It is live. It is live. Okay. Yes. All right. Awesome. Okay. Well, we are going to dive right in again. Um, <laughs> thank you for that introduction and thank you for being here tonight with us. Um, we are on chapter three, more about alcoholism. Um and we're not going to do um, as you know, we, we normally don't do a review or anything, but I'm going to ask just because I do know, I do know David sometimes. And I want to know um, if you have anything that you want to, you know, back up with, if there's anything you might want to say about more about alcoholism, the chapter or. Sure. I yeah. would love to do that if that's okay. okay. So, so I'm going to steal a little bit of pieces from everybody I've ever studied underneath, even though they didn't know me. Joe and Charlie, for instance. Joe and Charlie called this chapter uh, uh, a chapter about failure of self-will. That's what it's really about. It's a failure of self-will. Self-will has nothing to do with whether or not I stay sober or whether I can control the amount I drink or if I can stop on my own power or if I can fix my unmanageability in my life. Self-will has nothing to do with that. And that's the way Joe and Charlie describe it. But here's an interesting history fact that I, I found about this chapter and the next chapter, chapter four, we agnostics. So Hank Parkhurst was a big uh, proponent of and a, uh, of the big book. And he was a salesman and he pushed Bill to, to write this, this book. But he had to push Bill sometimes because Bill kind of put the pen down and wouldn't and would stop writing. So on, um, on uh, Hank's persistence that Bill start writing the book again, on September 15th, 1938, Bill started writing chapter three, We Agnostics or more about alcoholism, sorry, and we agnostics. 
this is this is the cool part. On September 27th, just two weeks later, 12 days later, he had a draft that he sent to uh, Dr. Bob. 12 days and wrote maybe some of the most spiritual pieces of literature you will ever read in your entire life, or I should say for me. the most We agnostics, one of the most spiritual pieces of literature I've ever read in my life. 12 days, he had rough draft enough to send to Dr. Bob. And that's something that Bill did on, on a regular basis. He would write a rough draft. He would uh, pray about it. He would write, put pen to paper. And then he would send the draft to, to uh, Dr. Bob in Akron. And then Dr. Bob would look it over. And sometimes they would take uh, words, like a lot of stuff out. Bill does a lot of run-on sentences if, if you watch his writings. And he has some lengthy, long paragraphs. And they're purposeful. And I wouldn't, I'm not saying change anything. Please understand, I'm not saying change anything. Because if you told me to write this book, we... <laughs> 25 years ago, we'd still be working. I'd be looking for the first word still. I don't know how he did it. It's like absolutely amazing what this book has done and how many lives it's changed. But I just find the history, like Summer brought up, so interesting. There's a big, there's a book that I'm I'm trying to read now. It's called uh, The Writing of the Big Book by William uh, Shaberg. So that's it right there. I don't know if it's coming up the right way on the screen. So that is a very thick book. And this guy studied for nine years to get the history of Alcoholics Anonymous to be precise. And you got to remember when this was, there was not a lot of documentation in 1935 when Dr. Bob and Bill met. They didn't document a lot of stuff. So uh, Schaefer really did a lot of hard work to try to find, he didn't put anything in the book that he can't back up with some facts. And again, this book is twice the size of the big book. So interesting book, love the book. Um, I'm going to get the audio book because this is really, this is a lot to read. <laughs> it's a lot to read. So, but I do a lot of driving. So um, that's kind of it. And then, then if you don't mind, I was going to go back. Um, I was going to do a little review. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. So a little review. So here we are in chapter three, more about alcoholism. So, or more about truth. How about that? How about more about truth? I'm going to find out about the truth here because the thing about it is it starts out in the first paragraph by saying most of us have been unwilling to admit that we're real alcoholics. So what is a real alcoholic? Well, we have studied the 10 pages of the doctor's opinion and up to page 29 thus far. So 39 total pages to see what, we, what we've learned about alcoholism. So we learned about two parts. We, we learned about the, the mind or the body, I'm sorry, the allergy that the doctor's uh, uh, Dr. Silkworth expresses in the doctor's opinion. And the first 23 pages about what happens that, to us when we put alcohol or drugs, whatever your drug and no choices in your body, that I break out in this, this craving, this abnormal reaction to something, meaning that when I put two, I set out to have two, I have 22. And I will always do that, right? And then the other part of the knowing that I'm a real alcoholic is the obsession in the mind. You know, without my permission, without my consent, I pick up a drink. You know, when I, when I said I wasn't going to do this anymore, when I, when I made these solemn oaths, when I, I promised myself that I was never going to drink again. And a lot of times you hear things in meetings, and, and, I, and I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. I repeat things I've heard from other people in meetings. And one of the things I heard in meetings is when alcoholics' lips are moving, they're lying. It's not true. Because when I said I was never going to drink again, I really, really meant it. Anyone else? Like, solemn oath, I'm never going to do this again? Like, I never was going to do this again. And I truly meant it. And I found myself drinking and drugging all over again. So it's not true when I truly mean it in my heart. But because of what the rest of the uh, writing here on this page talks about, it says, let's, I'm going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to stop about halfway through the paragraph and uh, expound upon this. It says, therefore, it's not surprising that our drinking careers, career, I had a drinking career. That's pretty, <laughs> that's so true. I mean, I started when I was 14 and I stopped when I was 38. And now I'm in my 60s. So therefore, it's not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove what? To prove that we can drink like other people. How many times did I set out to go to the bar with my friends and have two, and I had 22? Almost like every time. And then it says, the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every alcoholic, every abnormal drinker. Obsession, and an idea so strong that it makes me believe a lie that I could drink like a normal person again, that I could drink just like Johnny, my buddy I'm sitting next to at the, at the bar, that I can only have those two drinks and I can go home and eat dinner with my family. That is the great obsession 
of every abnormal drinker. And the abnormal drinker that he's talking about there is the real alcoholic, not the modic drinker on the page 20, and not the, and not the uh, hard, heavy hard drinker on the bottom of page 20, but the real alcoholic on page 21. And then it says, uh, many pursuant to the gates of the sanity or death. That is a, another truth for us. How many people die either directly or indirectly from the disease of alcoholism? A lot. We all know someone has died. I've lost family members to this disease, a countless amount of family members because of this illness. Untreated alcoholism. Untreated and then in the progression, in the chronic progressive stages of this disease. And then it says we had to learn, uh, we learn, and the we that we're talking about there is the first 100 that the where they had a 75% success rate back in the 1930s, that we had to we had to fully concede our innermost self that we were we were we were alcoholics. So that's a very strong paragraph, a little bit different than what's on page 58 of the big book. So page 58 gives us the steps, right? 58 and 59. And the and the first step says that we we are powerless over alcohol. Powerless. Yeah. No power, no choice, no control. I'm not going to argue that. But it gets watered down. We say, sometimes people say we're powers over people, places, and things. Please show me where that's at in the book. I'm not powers over people, places, and things. No, not at all. It's, it's silly. It's not in the book. But to say that we're fully conceded our innermost self, or fully conceded our innermost self, concession is conceding is, is strong, meaning it's conceded the truth that I have this allergy, that I will always have this allergy when I put it in my body. No matter what, if it, almost 25 years of sobriety, if I pick up today, I will break out in craving again. Or this obsession that I have, without my permission, without my consent, I will pick up a drink. And this malady, the, the description of the bedevilments on page 52, that is what I suffer from, all three folds of those disease. The, and this obsession is, again, it's so strong that I can't tell the difference between the true and the false. And it's described on Roman numeral 28 in the doctor's opinion. And then it says, after that, it says, this is the first step in recovery. That's how strong this really is, this sentence that Bill's talking about. That conceding my innermost self, my internal, this is an, an internal uh, disease with an internal solution. It has nothing to do with the way I was raised, the color of my skin, my sexual orientation, the kind of shoes that my parents bought me, whether or not they stay married or divorced, it has nothing to do with that. I have a biological difference inside of me that I was born with. And once I take a drink, I can't stop. And once I stop, I cannot stay stopped. And I suffer from this, this precondition of spiritual malady or untreated alcoholism. Then it says the delusion. So this is delusion, meaning the drunken delusion that we are like other people or presently has to be smashed. So in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, a lot of times they use words because maybe you'll hear in meetings, there's no must in Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, there's must in Alcoholics Anonymous. In the big book, there is. Maybe not in the meeting so much, but there is. And has to is a must. It has to be smashed. This is the idea that I can solve this on my own. My experience tells me over and over again that once I start drinking, I can't control the amount I drink. Once I stop, I cannot stay stopped. And I'm irritable, restless, and discontent when I'm stone cold sober. And then it says, next paragraph, we are like, we are alcoholics, uh, are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. So no power, no choice, no control, forever. I will never have that on my own power. And this is, we know that no real alcoholic the, so ever recovers control, meaning the craving. Well, I will always have the craving. Uh, I will never outgrow this allergy ever. Uh, the, um, where's my no-hood? This, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a permanent condition. It is not a passing disability. It is a permanent condition I will always have, no matter what. If I pick up a drink, I'm going to break out in craving here. And then uh, says the delusion that we have other people, um, I'm sorry, next paragraph. We know that no real alcohol ever, and I circle the word ever, recovers control. All of us fell at times we were gaining control, but such interval, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. That is the reason I got into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous, because that's how I felt. I absolutely loathed myself for the human being I became. A father of five daughters, still married, can't keep a job, can't go to work, can't get a sober breath, keep going to jail, going to go to prison. This was my life. It's the alcoholic life was the only one I knew.
bottom of page 25. It says, we are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type suffer from three folds of the disease are in a grip of a progressive illness. This is progressive. It never gets better. It always gets worse. I must have, and the question is for me anyways, are you a desperate alcoholic who needs a, needs a spiritual experience? I am a desperate alcoholic in the uncovered state. I need to have a spiritual experience. And this is over any considerable time we get worse, never better. What does that mean? Does it, sometimes it means jails or institutions. Sometimes it means divorce. Sometimes it means living in my car. Sometimes it means without ever seeing my children ever again. This is what it looks like for a real alcoholic who burns it all to the ground. And as we read stories in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill's story, we're going to read the man of 30, um, maybe today. I don't know if I don't shut up, we won't get that far. Um, <laughs> but man of 30, Fred's story, Jim's story. I'm reading those stories this way. Did I drink, think, or feel like them? I got to try to identify. I got to look for similarities, not differences. The same thing that I do when I go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous. I'm looking for similarities. I'm not looking for differences. I can find the differences so much easier, but I'm looking for similarities. And is if we get to the man at 30, we will see what he did. He made it a conscious decision not to drink for 25 years, a conscious decision on his own power. Somehow he pulled that off, but that was a conscious decision that he was going to drink again. No reservations whatsoever. I can't have them. You know, this is, this is how cunning, baffling, and powerful. So it says in the big book that alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful and how it works. If I was going to change anything in the big book, which I would not do, because I think it's perfectly written, and I'm a numbskull, so I don't get to say I don't get to do that. I would take the word that alcohol is cutting back and follow. I don't think alcohol is. Alcoholism is. Alcoholism is. I think it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. So um, I guess I took us up to the reading today anyway. So thank you, Summer, for letting me do that. Yeah. That's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. We needed that. We needed that. And wow, when you were talking, I was, uh, I noticed, I mean, the word, the control and like in a derogatory, I mean, lack of control five times you said it. Like, I mean, just on this one page, it's just, um, thank you so much for that. All right. And um, all right, bottom of page 30, here we go. We are like men who have lost their legs. They never grew, they never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every imaginable remedy. In some instances, there has been brief recovery, followed always, always by a still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. So it, it hadn't done so yet in this, in, you know, back when this was written, and it still has not even come close. It, it hasn't come to it yet. I mean, there's all these different um, things that can help the symptoms or help you know, um, I, I would say methadone or, you know, all these things that you can take the different drugs that seem to make, you, or what, and abuse that makes you throw up or makes you, you know, not have the crate, supposedly have less of the cravings, but that's, that's where the doctors have come to that. That's, that's what they, they have. And I mean, look at what science is doing. I mean, the amazing things that science is doing just in general, but not, and but we haven't come we haven't come very far with the alcoholism. That's how serious alcoholism is, and that's how there's only that vital spiritual experience. That's what we need. You know, there's no this the, the science sure may take you know may make the cravings a little less whatever severe, but has not accomplished this. And still to this day, it has not accomplished this. David, what do you have to say? Yeah, and some are brought up the word vital, and vital means uh, continued existence of something. If I'm going to live, I better have this vital spiritual experience, you know, and I should be convinced of this by now, too. By the time I get to page 30, and, and we're going to find out there's an allergy test in the bottom of page 31, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. But this little piece here that says, we are like men who lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Bill is so dramatic when he's writing, right? And, and been purposeful. Like, think about what that really means. 
And it goes back to my earlier statement that this is not a temporary condition or a passing disability. This is a permanent condition of, that I will always have. If I put alcohol or any drugs in my body, I will break out in craving, right? That's exactly what's going to happen to me. And neither does it appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind, our kind, what kind? The desperate kind, that kind. That's what I need to be. I need to be desperate. Like absolutely convinced in my, conceded my innermost self that I'm a real alcoholic. I need to do that. So if I'm the desperate kind, we have tried every imaginable remedy. And then in some instances, there's been brief recovery followed always by a sober or relapse. Anyone else identify with that? You know, David always brings this up when we do our studies. How many times did I surrender or concede to my innermost self maybe that I was? 10,000 times. And then 10,001, I picked up again. 10,001 on my own power. No power, no choice, no control. And I love what you said there about physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there's no such thing as making a normal drinker out, out of an alcoholic. There is no cure for the allergy. There isn't. Abstinence. You know what I have? I have an abnormal reaction to the abstinence. That's what I have. When I'm not drinking, I'm irritable, restless, and discontent. And my mind is conditioned to say pick up. That's why it's so vital that I have the spiritual experience. This. And, it's, and again, it's a progressive disease. It always it always a still worse relapse and then it says physicians are familiar with alcoholism agree there's no such thing to make a normal drink or have an alcoholic science may one day accomplish this but it hasn't done so yet so here's my favorite little line that i always say all the time sometimes i screw it up so i'll try not to if you take a cucumber and you put it in brine and you take it out of the brine you put it on the windowsill it turns into a pickle right how soon before that pickle turns back into a cucumber never once a pickle always a pickle we're all and if i was just speak for me i will always be a pickle no matter what i will never be able to drink like a normal person ever again i i've lost power choice and control so that, that that's all i have on that, that that little paragraph i believe but it's just understanding what positions are with us for the most part they understand that there's no treatment for that and usually and typically what they do is say you should go to alcoholics anonymous quick hand anonymous or daa that's what they, if they're really doing their job, that's what they should do. Because you know what? We know what the problem is. Bottom of page 17, that would not hold us together. But we also know what the solution is. I need to have both parts, problem and solution. And when I have both, I can change people's lives with that out of this book. That's all I got, Summer. Awesome. All right. Moving on, um, we are on the first paragraph of 31. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they are in that class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. David? Okay. So despite all we can say, many are real alcoholics. So let's do a little bouncing around the big book of alcoholics and I'm just, that's what I like to do. So let's go back to page 21 because in the bottom of page 20, we talked about the moderate drinker and the hard drinker, but let's find out what the real alcoholic looks like here. So I got two big books going here. I got one that I've written all over. I can't even read the writing on the page and one that I don't have any writing at. So I would choose that one. So I, I stay true to the text. Page 21, first paragraph. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start out off as a modded drinker. Anyone identify with that? Yeah, it was fun, right? Stop off, have a couple of drinks with the boys, girls, mm -hmm. you know, go home, go to bed, go to work. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. So this is described in the bottom of page 20. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to take a drink. I need to identify with that. Either I, either I lose all control and I need a casino my inner muscle that I'm a real alcoholic, or I think I can still control this thing. I'm, I'm, I have not done, I'm still a step zero. Step zero is going to get me drunk again, period, the end. I have to understand the first step. And that's what we're really in, in this chapter, more about alcoholism. So the first step is all 
doctor's opinion, those 10 pages, all the way up to page 43. So 53 total pages dedicated just to the first step of alcohol uh, for the first step. 53 total pages so that we have a strong foundation. Because if I don't understand step one, if I haven't considered my innermost self that I'm a raw alcoholic, why would I do the rest of this work? I wouldn't. I'm not going to, and I won't be able to do it because I'd be based off a lie that I don't need power that I can somehow someday manage and control the amount that I drink. That's a lie. I know the truth today. I can't do that. So uh, back to the set, uh, text here too. Um, make sure I'm on where I want to be at. Okay. It says by every form of deception and experimentation, page 31, first paragraph, I'm sorry, in the second sentence, but every form of deception and um, Self-deception, self-deception, it's important that I put that word self in there because this is really about self and about how it shows up in my life. This is about me believing the lie all the time. It has nothing to do, my wife, she gave me that look. My wife didn't have dinner ready when I got home. My kids are pulling each other's hair. My employer, he doesn't work and understand how hard I work. No, this is self-deception. This is me aligning to myself and experimentation. They always try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule. And let's stop right there. The rule is, that I, my rule is that I can control and start once again. We know that if I stop, I can never stay stopped. That's the steadfast rule. I need to know the rule. The rule is that once I start to drink, I break out in craving. And once I stop, I, I, can't, I can't stay stopped. That's the rule. And then it says there's, um, therefore, not alcoholic. For, so for anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like am i in the wrong paragraph no you're no perfect. i'm in the, okay i'm so sorry if anyone is showing the inability to control his drinking and do the right about face drink like a gentleman our hats are off to them you know what i've sponsored hundreds and hundreds of people since i've been sober and some of them kind of just disappeared and sometimes i run into them at the grocery store or at home depot or something you know what? They stopped going to meetings, they stopped working the steps, and they stopped drinking. What they found out, which is just as freeing as finding out that I'm a real alcoholic, is they're not a real alcoholic. If I qualify them on page 44, first paragraph, and ask them, once they start drinking, can they control the amount they drink? And once they stop, can they stay stopped? And they answered yes both times, but they have found another way to stay sober. We have no monopoly on how you do that. But if you're out of options like I was, then this is the program that I'm accepting, period, the end. I'm doing this because it worked for over 2 million people thus far that are sober today. That's not even counting all the millions of people who have passed on sober. So millions and millions and millions of people have gotten sober. So the inability to control is drinking. If I can do about face, then I would, but I can't do that. I don't have the power to be able to do that. Heaven knows we've tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. Anyone else identify with that? Absolutely, I tried to drink like other people. Don't you, wouldn't it be great after a, a uh, cutting the grass on a nice uh, hot summer day just to sit down? Like my wife will do yard work and she'll have a drink. She's not one of us. She will have maybe a beer. She only has beer after working out in the sun. She'll have a beer, bottle of beer. And she has to drink it when it's ice cold. Like I know this. Why would I know so much about my wife and her drinking? <laughs> <laughs> but I do. <laughs> she, she, she does. She'll have it. But she has to drink it quickly. But she only has one. That's all she has. She doesn't have another one. That's that's like alcohol abuse. I don't even understand that kind of drinking at all. <laughs> you know, it's just like that doesn't make any sense to me. But my hats are off to her because she she can have a drink. You know, but I, and, and let me just preface something too. For the first five years of my bride, maybe the first 10 years, maybe the first 15 years, I hardly even see my wife take a drink. Now she has a drink from time to time. Out of respect to me and my, and my disease that I, I was suffering from because I wasn't in the big book very much early in sobriety, I would just kind of like white knuckle in it probably. I was trying to help people the best I could. But when I started understanding the, um, the importance of how the, we should carry this message out of this book, my life started changing. And it really never started changing until I started practicing these principles on all my affairs. The directions for that are in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you didn't know that, you know that today. That, as I pointed out, the first 53 total pages of this book is dedicated to step one. And the directions for the steps end on page 103. So that means that more than half the book is dedicated to step one. And there's a chapter two action, into action, chapter six, is chapter, steps five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and 11. 
So that's six steps in five, seven steps in, um, in chapter six. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to work this window of opportunity that when we meet a new person, we don't know what it looks like, how, how fast the window is going to close on them. So we need to get them the guy quickly. So we need to work these steps briskly, quickly, vigorously, get them the guy quickly. Qualify them on page 44. Start reading the doctor's opinion to find out what we suffer from, the threefold disease, first in the, of the body, then of the mind, page 23 through 43. And then the obsession of the mind, which is on page 44, 45, and page 52, and other pages in the book, but that's for the most part. And then when I have an understanding of that, then I can say to my casino man and myself, yeah, I'm a real alcoholic. Do I desperately need Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous? And do I desperately need God? And that's the question I have to ask myself all the time. Do I desperately need this program? And do I desperately need God? And the answer for me is yes and yes. Because on my own power, I don't do very well. I hurt you. I harm other people. And behind those things is a drink. Please don't think for a moment. I've seen people with 20 and 30 and 40 years go back on and drink again. I don't want to have that experience. And I don't ever have to have that experience. But I have an obligation to carry this message out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I try to be armed with the facts about myself and about this disease. And the only place that I know that that exists is in the text of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all I got. Thanks, Summer. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think you covered it wonderfully. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going because this is, this is good. Okay, so here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking beer only. Never drinking in the morning. I'm sorry, wait, never, uh, I, mean, I skipped line. Drinking beer only, limiting the number of drinks, never drinking alone, never drinking in the morning, drinking only at home, never having it in the house, never drinking during business hours, drinking only at parties, switching from scotch to brandy, drinking only natural wines, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off forever, with and without a solemn oath, taking more physical exercise, reading inspirational books, going to health farms and sanitariums, accepting voluntary commitment to asylums. We could increase the list ad infinitum, I think is how you pronounce it. And infinitum. Then, is it the, well, how is it pronounced? Infinitum. 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 Okay. Yes. Infinitum. And like, here are just all these methods and like, I mean, here's the self, here's the experimentation and all of the things that we've tried. I mean, the list can go on just, and I mean, I've, I've heard people say we could turn these right into questions. Have we ever tried to just mm. drink beer only? Have we ever tried to limit our number of drinks? Never drink during business hours, never having it in the house. Like, well, I didn't have a house. No, I'm just kidding. But well, I didn't. Mm. But I mean, that's that's something that mm. my mind, my self-deception would have said, oh, well, that doesn't work. That doesn't count. Not this one, not that one. But there's only, but all of these in some form or fashion have been something like, have have you taken a trip, not taken a trip, swearing it off forever? And, um, you know, asking these questions, have, have, have this been, any, have these been anything that you've tried? Um, what about you, David? <laughs> yeah, and I, and I won't uh, I'll be redundant because what you said is perfect. Like, turn those statements into questions, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's really, a, haven't we all tried that? I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone would necessarily be on here if you weren't an alcoholic, but maybe you are, maybe you're an Al-Anon, or maybe you're just interested in a Zoom meeting to find out what the big book's about. But yeah, my experience is I've tried every one of those. Checkbox exercise. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Tried them all. Failed every single freaking time on my own power. You know, in the word um, uh, ad infinitum there, so let me give you the um, definition of that. It means without or limitless. So uh, we could increase the list. It's limitless. So limitless means like, okay, how about uh, have I tried going to treatment centers, right? Get a 28-day reprieve. How's that work for you? You know, treatment centers, you know, um, the amount of success that they have turning out patients to, that stay sober, very low number. And I'm not putting down treatment centers. But the thing is, is like, if I still think I have a plan that I can execute on my own power, don't use your plan. <laughs> Please don't use your plan. Tell us your plan. <laughs> Whatever it is, don't do it though. Because my plan is going to get me drunk again. You know, that's, that's one thing that David and I express when we go to treatment centers. If you have a plan, 
don't use your plan. Tell us your plan. I promise you that it's not going to work. I haven't tried everything to stay sober, but I tried a lot of things. And a lot of those things are on this page here. You know, and one of the things that talked about, and it's in uh, bracketed here, it says with or without a solemn oath. You know, Bill's describing what he did in the, in the family Bible with his wife, Lois. He wrote in the family Bible and he meant it. Again, this is an alcoholic. When his lips are moving, is he lying? No, Bill meant it. He wrote a solemn oath in the Bible and he was a great writer as we know. And he said he was never going to drink again. And he wrote it, I can't remember how many times now, seven times, something like that. He wrote different uh, entries in the family Bible. And he meant it every single time. But you know what he did? He got drunk eight times. Seven times wrote it, he got drunk eight. Every single time. Because why? No power, no choice, no control. Do I desperately need Alcoholics Anonymous? And do I desperately need God? And that's just something that was missing in my life. And today it's not. So um, how about jails or prisons? How about taking a trip, a geographical move, right? How about what Summer said, like moving from an apartment to my backseat of my car? <laughs> That's where I live now. Like that, it's not funny because it's true for some of us, right? That is a geographical move too. None of those things are going to work for me there. And again, increase the list the way you want to increase it. It's true. I need a vital spiritual experience. They talked about it on page 27 of this book, Carl Jung talking to Rowan Hazard, that we must have this. And when it does, if you, want, you guys want to go to it, page mm -hmm. 27 in the fourth paragraph. And I'm going to, I'm not going to set the whole pair. I'm not going to set the whole story for you because we're limited on time, but it says here, fourth paragraph. Yes, reply the doctor. There is exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times here and there once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. So vital again is continual existence of something and experience is something that I'm, I'm going to have through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. To me, these occurrences are phenomenon. So he, this is one of the leading psychoanalysts in the whole wide world, maybe the leading psychoanalyst. And he's saying, I can observe this, but I can't explain it to you. I can't explain this phenomenon. That's what a phenomenon is. And here's what they look like. This is what must happen for me. This is what a vital spiritual experience looks like. They appear, they appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, ideas, emotions, and attitudes. So my, my emotions are my feelings. My attitudes are my beliefs. And uh, what was the last one? I lost my, but my attitudes are my beliefs. My emotions are my feelings. My ideas are my thinkings, right? Mm -hmm. Which were once the guiding force of my life. That's what drove me. These men are suddenly cast to one aside and a completely new set of conception and motive begin to dominate them. All those things are change, 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 and more change, right? That's what we're talking about there. And oh, by the way, this must happen for me if I'm going to recover. And no human power can produce this. None. No human power can produce this. You get, ever tried the things that were back? Let's go, let's go back to page 31, second paragraph. Again, getting in the, add the list, add infinitum. Different relationship better job, promotion, better house, whatever. None of those things work for me. That's it. Very the end. And it says, uh, um, so all those things that I try to work on my own power, again, like I pointed out, I have to let go of those old ideas. We talked to, we're going to talk about that a whole lot in the next chapter about how my prejudices get in the way and block me from the power and how all my old ideas need to be let go of here. But we're not there yet. We're still trying to figure out and one other thing about this chapter, more about alcoholism. Bill references this chapter a whole lot of times and to the employers, to the wives. Uh, um, and I think one time in the family afterward, but a bunch of times they said, go back and read more about alcoholism. This is a value chapter too. You know, Bill, Bill is a wizard. He's a mystic. I don't, you know, yes, he had a lot of people he put placed in his life, right? To help him write this stuff. But the guy is just brilliant, man. I just, what he's done for us is, no coincidences, coincidences, period, the end. That's all I got on that one there. Thank you, Summer. Awesome. And I agree with you about Bill too. Awesome. All right. Um, bottom of page 31. We do not like to pronounce any individual as alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Try to... Try to drink and stop abruptly. 
Try it more than once. It will not take long for you to decide. If you are honest with yourself about it, it may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. I love the directions that you have to do it. You do it more than once. Try to drink or you drink and stop abruptly. Take three drinks and, you know, stop. See if you can do that. Try it more than once. You know, for me, my, my self-deception was always, I, I would remember this one time, the one, one time that I could control that night. And it was like, well, eh, maybe I'm not, you know, like, cause I, I would have to have, you know, it would just have to be every night, right? Is what I'm thinking. But I would, my mind would, the self-deception would, you know, tell me, oh, you're not an alcoholic because, you know, remember you you did it this one time. And like, that's, but that's baloney, right? That's baloney. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I tried to prove myself an exception to the rule always. And, um, you know, here we go. I mean, I, I've never tried the experiment. I don't know if you have David, but here are some directions, you know, we want to, we want to qualify our sponsees, obviously, but also give them the dignity I heard today in a share to qualify themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this could be an option. What do you think, David? <laughs> uh, I absolutely love that. And David and I always preface that when we go to treatment center, we're not here to diagnose any of you. We're just telling you that we're alcoholics and drug addicts for the simple reason that we're going to explain to you the first step and mm -hmm. that we found the solution that's written in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's about having a relationship with power. So, yeah, I agree with that completely. I mean, I have never really said to anybody that I've sponsored, all the people I've worked with, that you're an alcoholic except for one guy. One guy, man, dude, he just kept going to prison and coming in and out and burning it to the ground and getting an accident, get his mouth wired shut and end up being in the hospital, broke every bone in his body and car. I mean, all these things. And, and he called me up one time. I said, dude, you need to come over to my house. And he goes, well, how am I going to get there? I said, well, I'll come and get you. I forgot you don't have a car. And I went and picked him up. And I said, dude, you're a real alcoholic. You're going to die or get locked up permanently. Period. The end. He's the only guy I ever told that to. But again, I'm not pronouncing anyone alcoholic. It's for them to decide for themselves, right? And if they decide for themselves and they say to me, will you work with me? And I'm going to ask them one simple question. Are you willing to go to any links? Why are you asking me to be your sponsor? Are you and um are, are you willing to read the 164 pages of this book? And if they answer one of the questions like why am I why do you want me to sponsor you or why why am I doing this work so get my wife back? I can't help you with that, dude. Sorry, I can't. But if you want to have a spiritual experience, I know how to get you that right out of this book. So it says um so I'm not pronouncing anyone an alcoholic, but if you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room and try some control drinking. That is the last thing I'm going to suggest to somebody, first of all. I, it, this is the allergy test, right? And you said it well, perfectly. It, what that means is the Marty Mann rule. Marty Mann was one of the first women in Alcoholics Anonymous, and she tried to have two drinks a day, like reasonable drinks, guys. <laughs> not, not this. <laughs> reasonable drinks a, a day. At the same time, Two drinks a day at the same time and stop abruptly and do that for a month. <laughs> How hard is that to do? Now, if you told a, a normal person to do that, they'd be like, yes, it seems to be a little upset. That, that's a lot. <laughs> I don't know if I want to have two drinks a day every day for a month <laughs> at the same time. But for an alcoholic, once I put it in my body, I'm going to break out of craving. So that's really what this paragraph is talking about there, that I will not be able to control the amount I drink once I start. Again, when I start out with it, having two drinks, I'm going to have 22 drinks. And maybe, like you said, Summer, maybe I could have two once in a while, and I'd be like, oh, look at you, bro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you did that. And you went to bed, and you went home and ate dinner with the family. The next time, it's off to the races. And then it's also talking about things like drinking non-alcoholic beer. You know, it's like, okay, how about non-alcoholic It says... Not on the label it says not to be used by alcoholics. It says that. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows that, but it says not to be used by because there's a little bit of alcohol in it. How about scripts? Every drug I may I may not have a problem with, right? I may not have a problem with certain drugs. I you know, weed I just stopped abruptly along like years and years ago. But remember, there was a time where I didn't have a problem with alcohol either. I was just a moderate drinker. But eventually. Whatever my drug of no choice is at that time, 
I'm going to have a problem with it because I'm a real alcoholic and a real drug addict. So I'm really careful with the scripts that I give be given. I let the doctor and the dentist know that I'm a real alcoholic. I tell them way ahead. I've had knee surgery. I've had oral surgery. I let them know I have. And, um, uh, Ashton is here and I'll probably screw this up, but, um, hi Ashton. <laughs> I, I think I had tramadol. Is that something I probably had when I had knee surgery? Okay. <laughs> She's a nurse. <laughs> Well, was it IV or was it a pill? It was a pill. Oh, yeah. It's one of the Is that few. what I had? Okay. But I took it as prescribed and I took it only when I needed it, which was only for a couple of days. Because I'm a real alcoholic and drug addict. And I may not have a problem with it at the moment, but I will have a problem with it in the future because I'm a real alcoholic and drug addict. So the last thing I'm going to tell someone to do is try some more controlled drinking. That's the last thing. But what we've learned so far, we've learned a lot about ourselves from the doctor's opinion up to page 30 of this book, what a real alcoholic looks like. So that is probably the last thing I'm going to suggest to them. And um, there's other tests. There's like five tests in the big book of alcoholics. And I don't have time to go into all of them. Just keep studying with summer. You'll run across them. I promise you. Uh, page 31 at the top of the page. It says, uh, is that where we're at? 32. I'm sorry. Page 32, top of the page. Um, Bottom of the page is 31 and third paragraph. So it says, try it. Now turn the page more than once. Can I control it? No. My experience tells me I can't. It will not take you long to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. I need to know the truth. The truth is that, no, I can't. And I wouldn't even want to try that test. It sounds awful to have two drinks a day. I don't want to have that. I'm just getting started after two. And it may be worth a bad case of jitters or get locked up or lose my kids because I was drinking and driving, or leave my kids alone, or take my kids to the dope house. That's not beneath me. I never did those things, but it could happen. And it says, um, um, it may be a bad case of if you get full knowledge of your condition. So that's what I need to know. I just need to know the whole experience. So when I put a drink in my body, I, I, I keep emphasizing this and reemphasizing it. What happens to me? I break out of craving. Once I stop this, the obsession of mine, I drink again. And I suffer them from this malady that we're going to get to on page 52 eventually. And it's okay. You're doing a great job, Summer. Take your time. That's what this book is all about. Let's take our time. Not with the newcomer when we're working one-on-one, -on -one, but we have plenty of time for the rest of our life to take our time and do a deep dive into the study of this like you're doing here, Summer. So brilliant job. Um, that I, I could go on a little bit more. We're running out of time. So, But uh, this is a progressive and chronic disease. And I need to arrest it. And I can't do it with my own power. That's all I got there. Awesome. All right. We're going to do uh, one more paragraph. If you're okay with that. You're the boss. Absolutely. All right. Um, though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who showed definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period of time because of an overpowering desire to do so. I'm not even going to say the last line because we're not reading that, but um, because it's, here is one, but um, right. we're not moving on to that. But I'd love to hear what you have on this, um, the beginning parts of this paragraph, David. So there's stages of this of this progression of this disease, right? And this is one of them that they're talking about here. A different book, I had a movie. Same book, just different writing in my book. Though there's no way of proving, we believe that uh, early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. How come non-alcoholics don't ever have to prove that they don't have a problem? But we alcoholics always had to say, I don't have a problem. It's like we're always trying to prove to ourselves or to someone else that I don't have this problem. Normal people don't ever have to do this. So in our, uh, this is, again, talking about uh, a drinking career. So the progressive stage of this drinking, remember, in the doctor's opinion, we, we drink for the effect produced, right? That's, that's why we drink a drug, for the, the effect produced. Um, drink to function. Sometimes I have to drink to function, right? Can't think straight. I got the jitters. It's the only thing that works for me. I want to feel like a normal human being. And alcohol and drugs did that for me for a very long time until one day it stopped. And I was a slave to it. I couldn't stop no matter what. Um, then the uh, last thing is drinking to oblivion, drugging to oblivion. These are the three stages that I go through. And every um, 
and we're not going to get to it like uh, like Summer said here. But remember in the in the stories that we're that we're setting up here that every story here and there's four stories in this chapter. So there's it's going to be the man of thirty, Jim's story, um, Fred's story, and the Jaywalker. Three of them are real, one of them are fictional, right? But but every story has a lie in it, and every story has truth in it. And it's for me to discover as I study this book. And again, we study this book because it is a textbook. It is meant to be read and studied. And that's a great job that Summer's doing here. And it's 7.59, so I think I'll shut my app. <laughs> Perfect timing. David, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And thank you, everyone, for coming here on this um, wonderful Friday night. I love sharing Friday night with you guys. And um, we will open up the floor for questions and answers for a couple of minutes and any sort of comments. So just let me stop the recording.